British soldiers under attack in Iraq. Troops flee for their lives as a mob firebombs their vehicle. Welcome to a special ITV evening news. All this week, as part of the programmes to mark our 50th birthday, former presenters are rejoining the team. Today, it's Julia Somerville. Good evening. Also on tonight's programme... Tagging does not work. The technology that they've got is too poor to work. Tagging scandal. Would Marion Bates still be alive if it wasn't for a series of shocking mistakes? Death on the beach. The gangmaster on trial for killing 21 cockle pickers. And... And if she dabbles in stuff and she's a bit of a party person, that's just purely her business. It doesn't interfere with her work or her looks, and it's nobody's business. Leave Kate alone. Kate Moss's career on the line. Is the fashion world right to support the drug-taking star? Good evening. It's an attack that's as vicious as it's worrying. British soldiers firebombed in Iraq and forced to flee for their lives. The full drama was captured on camera and just look at these scenes. An armoured vehicle is pelted with missiles by a furious mob and set on fire. And here, one of the troops inside is forced to run for safety but is only confronted by an angry crowd. Incredibly, it's thought the soldiers were not seriously injured. The riot was sparked by the arrest of two other British military personnel for allegedly firing on Iraqi police. And that came on the same day there were new calls for our troops to be withdrawn. Our senior correspondent James Mates reports on the latest British soldiers under attack. Basra has been simmering for weeks. Today it came to the boil. A British armoured fighting vehicle, a warrior, was set upon by an angry crowd, petrol bombs raining down onto the hull. So many petrol bombs, it was clear that this was a planned ambush. The warrior moved first back and then forward, but seemed unable to find a way through the crowd, its commander resisting any temptation to open fire on the attackers. These vehicles are designed to resist flames, but this was burning so fiercely the crew inside clearly began to worry that either their fuel or their ammunition might explode. One soldier preferred to clamber out, risking the flames and the mob. He was quickly set upon with stones and a large stick. We can see again in slow motion how he had to dice with the flames and missiles from the crowd just to get through the hatch. It's not possible to see what happened to him on the ground. Okay, okay, inshallah. Two still photos from the attack show another soldier engulfed in flames as he escaped the vehicle. Amazingly, the Ministry of Defence say okay, no okay, British personnel suffered serious injuries. As the situation cooled and British reinforcements okay, arrived, okay, some Iraqi wounded were seen being carried away. It is reported that two Iraqis were killed and 15 injured. The attack had been provoked, it seems, by the arrest of two British troops working undercover, held by the Iraqi police for allegedly opening fire on one of their patrols. These photographs of the two men were released by the Iraqis. All this on a day that the Liberal Democrats back here have called for a British withdrawal from Iraq. There is a need for the British government to state clearly and unequivocally what its exit strategy is. If this appears to be the case, there's now a breakdown of relationships uh, between the British military in the south of Iraq and the civilian authorities, then the position of our troops is bound to be very hazardous indeed. Within the past fortnight, three British soldiers have been killed by roadside bombs, a serious escalation in a part of Iraq spared from the worst of the insurgency. In the British sector, the population is almost entirely Shia, for the most part sympathetic to the coalition. If they are beginning to turn against Britain and America, the occupation of Iraq may be running into serious trouble. James Mates, ITV News. Well, let's go to our political correspondent, Libby Vina, who's at the Ministry of Defence this evening. Libby, what more can you tell us about the soldiers who are being held? Well, Mark, the Ministry of Defence is saying very little indeed about the two men we can uh, surmise from the fact that they were arrested wearing civilian clothing, that they were on some kind of undercover mission. 
The MOD won't confirm that. All they will say is that every effort is being made tonight at the very highest level in government to try and get the two men released. Now, I am told there were a series of operations at the weekend to arrest suspected insurgents in Basra. It may well be that the men's uh, mission was connected in some way with that. Whatever it was, it's clear it went disastrously wrong. Two men who were sent to Iraq to try and help the Iraqi forces tonight inside a Basra police station. Now, it used to be said that Iraqis viewed British troops with less hostility than the Americans. Uh, is that now no longer the case? Well, I think the facts uh, speak for themselves. Three British soldiers killed in Iraq this month. A number of Iraqi civilians killed in very appalling circumstances, roadside bomb attacks and attacks on restaurants where people had gathered. The fact is, I don't think Basra is Baghdad yet, but the images that we saw tonight of those British troops under attack, I think, will have shocked many people and raised awkward questions about the direction of the government's policy in Iraq. OK, Libby Vina, thank you very much indeed. He was jailed for the murder of the Nottingham jeweller Marion Bates and today it emerged he was only free to take part in the robbery in which she was shot because of a catalogue of mistakes. An official report says 19-year-old Peter Williams had been released from prison 20 days before her killing and he'd breached so many terms of his probation that he should have been back in jail. Paul Davis is in Nottingham tonight. Paul. Julia, this is an electronic tag. Criminals often have to wear them as a condition of being released early. It allows the authorities to track their movements. If the criminals remove their tag, they go back to jail. Well, that's the theory anyway. But in this disastrous case, a young thug who removed his tag was left free. Free to go into the jewellery shop across the road there and take part in the brutal murder of Marion Bates. Today, we've been hearing about the chain of errors that allowed that to happen. Victor Bates watched his wife gun down in front of him. He's been forced to close down the family jewellery business because of crime. So many painful experiences and it doesn't seem to end. Now he knows one of the youths jailed for his wife's murder shouldn't have been free to take part in the crime. Peter Williams had a long history of trouble. He'd been freed early from a previous sentence on condition that he wore a tag. Williams had illegally removed his tag. He should have been rearrested, but the private company monitoring his movements delayed informing the police. Victor Bates told me he can't help thinking that but for a series of mistakes in monitoring a serial offender, his wife Marion might still be alive today. Does it pass through your mind reading that report that your wife's death could have been avoided? Oh, yes, of course it does. Yeah, it would have been. You know, I would never be in the state where I break down at just the thought of it now. You know, I mean, it's just all too much. Are you angry today? Oh, yes. Still very angry. I'm angry at a system that doesn't protect the public and spends millions of our money on pretending they're doing so, on an illusion that's not borne out by fact. His anger is understandable. The failure to immediately report the removal of the tag was one of a catalogue of errors. Peter Williams had been serving a sentence for a string of burglaries when he was released early on licence. First, his electronic tag was fitted late, by which time he'd repeatedly breached his curfew. He also failed to attend seven probation meetings and broke the terms of his licence, which should have meant he returned to prison. But probation staff were slow to act and he remained free to commit further crimes. Premier, the private company responsible for tagging Williams, has admitted mistakes were made. The government has promised improvements. We want to make sure that as, as, as much as we can, we limit the possibility of the sort of mistakes that happened in the Bates case ever happening again. We can never guarantee that it will never happen, but we're going to make it as less likely as we possibly can. Lessons have been learnt is the message. Unfortunately, a popular and well-loved woman had to die before they were. Paul Davis reporting there. He was the gang master. He was responsible, part of the prosecution's opening statement against Lin Liang Ren, the man accused of a manslaughter of at least 21 Chinese cockle pickers in Morecambe Bay last year. 
The jury at Preston Crown Court heard how the victims drowned because of Wren's criminal negligence. He denies the charges. From Morecambe, Geraint Vincent reports on a beach tragedy. It's a deadly tide at Morecambe. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time here, it'll kill you. Last year, 21 people, desperate to earn a living, came here to pick cockles from the exposed seabed. But over the next few hours and days, it was their bodies which were being gathered up from the sandbanks. The dead were all illegal immigrants from China, and on trial for manslaughter at Preston Crown Court today was the man said to be their boss, 29-year-old Lin Liang Ren. The prosecution QC, Tim Holroyd, told the jury that Wren was the gangmaster controlling the cockle pickers, that he was responsible for them and that he had completely failed to take proper care for their safety. The court heard that on the night of the tragedy, not only was there due to be a high tide, but very bad weather was forecast as well. Local cockle pickers either weren't going out at all or they were going out just for very short periods of time. Not so, say the prosecution, the cocklers in Wren's gang. They were working in the cold and the dark and the wind and the rain, and they stayed out there for too long. And when the tide came in, they were trapped. Mr Holroyd went on. Wren, he said, tried to leave the scene. When police asked him what happened, he used a different name and gave an untruthful account of his movements. He instructed the Chinese survivors that they must not tell anyone that he was the boss and must instead say that the men in charge had drowned. Among Wren's co-defendants are father and son David and Tony Eden, the Liverpool fish merchants said to have been buying the cockles that Wren's gang picked. They're charged with immigration offences. This case is concerned not just with the deaths of 21 desperate people, but what they were doing here in the first place. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Morecambe Bay. Now imagine a situation where Labour and the Conservatives had to share power between them. Not easy really, is it? Well, something similar is facing Germany tonight, after its two main parties finished neck and neck in the general election. Angela Merkel is claiming the right to be Chancellor, having won three more seats than Gerhard Schroeder. But that hasn't stopped him from claiming victory as well. From Berlin, Juliet Bremner reports on Germany's new political crisis. Wild celebrations as Germany was reunited. Theirs was the biggest economy in Europe. They'd make it even bigger, even stronger. But as the decade unfolded, it got more and more bogged down. Today, the Germans are struggling to complete the grand vision. In Berlin, they're still busy building along the line of the old wall. But the country has lost its confidence. This is all that now remains of the Berlin Wall. The physical partition may have largely gone, but the divide between West and East still remains, both economically and in what they want their politicians to do to try and restore the fortunes of their united country. <laughs> Angela Merkel has three more seats than her nearest rival, but flowers are about her only consolation. She claims the right to be Chancellor, but voters have made it clear they don't like her package of economic reforms. Technically the loser, but acting as if he swept the board, Gerhard Schroeder refuses to concede defeat. He remains confident that he has a better chance of putting together a government. In truth, the Germans have voted their country to a political and economic standstill. At a cafe in East Berlin, I met some students. They all voted for different parties and all had different ideas about the effect of this stalemate. Now we have the situation where we actually have two losers both wanting to become chancellor. And I just hope that you know, the parties will agree on a coalition pretty quickly to resolve the stalemate. And, uh, because the last thing Germany needs is a long time of uncertainty. I think the situation now is the opposite of standing still. It's going forward. It will move forward. It's, it's not anymore that you have the two big parts of, of politics. I see a good future for Germany because we're still a very rich country. You still have all uh, possibilities to do here. Um, um, and so um, I think we, that, that we will, all the young people here will have a future. Whatever the difference is, they agree it'll be three weeks before they know the identity of their new leader and the colour of their new coalition. Juliet Bremner, ITV News, Berlin.
Still to come on the evening news, speaking out, he was Britain's most senior policeman. Now Sir John Stevens talks to us about the police's shoot-to-kill policy and investigating Diana's death. Our inquiry is different to the French inquiry. We're looking at conspiracy allegations. We're also using some of the techniques that the French didn't have seven years ago to our advantage. And back for our 50th birthday, Julia remembers her days presenting the news on ITV. But first, it's British fashion's biggest week and she's its biggest star. But all the attention at London Fashion Week was today focused on Kate Moss's private life and reports about her alleged cocaine use. Will they mean she'll be dropped by the companies who use her looks to promote their image? The star's friends and the fashion world have leapt to her defence, but are they right? Keir Simmons reports on the scandal that's threatening to engulf Kate's career. She's been a fashion icon for more than a decade. But the talk here at London Fashion Week is that Kate Moss is now facing the biggest challenge of her career. Over the last week, the supermodel from Croydon has faced one damaging story after another. Kate Moss is supposed to be pictured on magazine covers rather than in a newspaper apparently taking cocaine. She is risking her career and, more important, her health. Many of her fashion friends are supporting her. Do you know what? She's living her life like everybody else. She's not doing anything different to what your next door neighbour does. If she dabbles in stuff and she's a bit of a party person, that's just purely her business. It doesn't interfere with her work or her looks and it's nobody's business. Leave Kate alone. But as London Fashion Week got underway today, at least one of the high street stores currently using her said they are very disappointed. Of course, the fashion industry does have a lot of money invested in Kate Moss. Is she going to completely reform, get rid of the dodgy boyfriend, concentrate on being a fabulous model and a brilliant mother? And if that's the case, then I think she is going to be all right. It's reported Kate Moss has decided to dump her boyfriend, Pete Doherty, and has told fashion bosses it won't happen again. Even so, if the claims are true, it suggests she has a dangerous addiction and needs help. Keir Simmons, ITV News. NASA has announced plans to send man back to the moon 33 years after their last mission. The one-week stay in 2018 will see a four-man crew travel to the moon in a capsule similar to those used in the Apollo program. It's hoped that the $1 billion mission will eventually lead to a manned expedition to Mars. Now he's a man with the authority to talk about everything from the terror threat facing Britain to the death of Princess Diana. And today he talked to ITV News. The former Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir John Stevens also spoke to me about the pressure on his successor, Sir Ian Blair, over the police killing of an innocent Brazilian in London. For five years, he was Britain's top cop and the man who introduced the controversial shoot-to-kill policy, a policy that led to the shooting of Jean-Charles de Menezes in Stockwell and to pressure on the current commissioner, Sir Ian Blair. Sir Ian Blair was your deputy when it was introduced. He was in charge when uh, this man was shot dead. Uh, do you think he should resign? What has to happen here is we have to be cool, calm and collected, wait until we see what the IPCC comes up with, wait and see what the conclusions are. No conclusion should be drawn until that inquiry has taken place. The impression was clearly given by Sir Ian and the force that this was a suspicious character, that he had vaulted the barrier, that he had not stopped when he was challenged uh, and yet it became clear from papers leaked to us that this was simply not true. Should Sir Ian have uh, publicly come out and corrected those statements? I think you're going to have to ask Sir Ian that and I, I, again I go back to the situation of saying look let's wait till this full independent inquiry comes up with its conclusions. But do you accept that he's in a position of some difficulty? Most commissioners have, have difficult periods because it's an incredibly difficult job and it's up to the commissioner to see his way through that. On the broad point of a shoot-to-kill policy, you're being seen as judge, jury, executioner. Going back to the shoot-to-kill, it's not shoot-to-kill, it's, it's, it's a lethal option. Now, what do you do in a situation where you're either protecting yourself or you're protecting members of the public? What you have to do is ensure you take 
the necessary steps based on the intelligence and information you're given at, at the time. In a book published today, he writes of his sour relationship with the former Home Secretary, David Blunkett, and effectively accuses him of lying. Well, this is not personal in any way, shape or form. This is actually about putting the record straight. But um, I'd like to see uh, honesty in, in public life, and uh, I'm sure everybody else would. And do you think Mr Blunkett deserves to be a Cabinet Minister back in the Cabinet? That's totally a matter for Mr Blunkett and the, and the Prime Minister, not for me. And finally, he told me his ongoing investigation into the death of Princess Diana is far from complete. This has been a, a very thorough inquiry indeed. We're continuing doing that. We've only just actually got the car back three weeks ago from France, uh, from the French authorities. We're examining every part of that car. Remember that our inquiry is different to the French inquiry. We're looking at conspiracy allegations. We're also using some of the techniques that the French didn't have seven years ago to our advantage. We're also interviewing new witnesses and re-interviewing old witnesses. So there's a lot of work still to be done on that. Lord Stevens speaking to me earlier today. Now let's get a reminder of tonight's main news. British soldiers have been firebombed by an angry crowd in Iraq and forced to flee for their lives from an armoured vehicle. It's thought the soldiers escaped serious injury. Police have admitted a catalogue of mistakes allowed Peter Williams to break his curfew to take part in the murder of the Nottingham jeweller Marion Bates. And the trial has begun of the alleged gang master accused of the manslaughter of at least 21 Chinese cockle pickers in Morecambe Bay last year. The main story is from calendar tonight. 28-year-old Reuben Wilson dies during the Great North Run, which he did to raise money for his sick nephew. And child abuse campaigner Faye Banks talks about how she was beaten and locked away at the age of six. She's spearheading a new NSPCC campaign. Now, before we end the programme, time to talk a little bit about us for a moment and more specifically our 50th birthday celebrations and even more specifically about you, Julia, who uh, you've come to help us celebrate. And I should say, welcome back. Well, it's quite weird to be here, I have to say, because it's obviously strangely familiar. But judging by the way I've been blundering around in the corridor, some uh, things have <laughs> changed. But I am... Uh, just the latest in a long line of on-screen partners, am I not? Yes, I've been very lucky. There's been some extremely high-class totty that uh, uh, IGN uh, have provided <laughs> for me over the years. Um, it's been actually fantastic looking back through the archive and uh, seeing exactly what went on during the 14 years that I was here. And uh, I've prepared a little something as a part of my trip down memory lane. Oh, dear. I know that things can only get it was the end of the Tory era. Mobile phones were changing the pace of communication and there was yet another glorious failure by England's footballers. In the States, Bill Clinton took the presidency for the Democrats and Nelson Mandela took his place as the first democratically elected leader of a free South Africa. Although President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev are the stars of the show, there are three months after I started, I was in Washington presenting the lunchtime news as Russia's President Gorbachev paid his historic visit to the summit with Ronald Reagan. The world was watching as the Cold War inched towards its end. And then the first Gulf War, a new enemy, but an eerily familiar name in Washington. President Bush said the liberation of Kuwait was the goal, not the defeat of Iraq. New technology meant we covered this conflict in more detail than ever before. Julia, we could just about hear you. We'll be back to you when Tony Blair comes, if not before. Thanks very much. Meanwhile, perhaps you're allowed to have a little glass of something yourself. I don't know, perhaps professional duty. Maybe I duty. already have, but I'm not telling. Right. <laughs> Labour stormed victory after 18 years in the wilderness. There was a sense of a new beginning, a fresh start. But just three months after those euphoric scenes in Downing Street, the nation was united again, this time in shock and grief. Chris, you were obviously in there. Tell me your feelings about the service. Julia, that was most, one of the most extraordinary things I've ever been at. In 2001, I had the privilege of launching ITN's very own news channel. During my ITN years, I had more screen husbands than Elizabeth Taylor. Like her, there were eight, but she cheated by marrying the same man twice. By the way, to avoid punch-ups, they're in strict chronological order. 
<laughs> yeah, that last one was adorable, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, didn't you all think? very handsome men, I must say. Have you enjoyed yourself? <laughs> very much so, yes. It's been uh, quite an eye-opener for Good. me, I must well, say. It's been a privilege to have you back. Well, it's been oh, lovely, lovely to be here, yeah. I must say. And as part of ITV's Back for Our Birthday Week, I'll be over on the ITV News Channel next to answer your calls and emails and talk about what it's like to be back. Yes, do join Julia for that and join me again tomorrow for the ITV Evening News with Selena Scott. But from your ITV newsrooms around the country and from us, bye-bye. Goodbye. Hey.